Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the Firefish Recruitment uh, Podcast. I'm delighted to be here um, with Andrew Saletto, who has um, been working with lots of recruitment entrepreneurs and elite sports um, leaders as well, or, or performers. Um, so we're going to have the next sort of 35 um, minutes or so, just understanding, learning from his experience and seeing what we can take from that into our own businesses. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Pleasure yeah. to be here. Do you want to just start off by just sort of giving us a wee bit of an overview of, um, you know, your experience and background? Yeah. OK, so very short history. I left school straight into sales, as, as many people do, and uh, worked my way up into different organizations and then uh, cut my teeth at Yellow Pages back in 2004. But I had a sports career that was running parallel to that. Uh, and in 2007, got picked up by a consultancy business who asked me to come into their organization and talk about the winning mindset. And it kind of just triggered a, a, a new career uh, in, in performance coaching and um, consulting. So I did that for a while with a company called Blue Sky Performance Improvement. And then then got picked up by S3 in 2009. Uh, so that's where I kind of ended up into, into the world of recruitment. I had an amazing time there. Uh, and my role was to work with a, a brilliant team of con consultants, leadership consultants. And we delivered programs globally and uh, was there till 2012 and then started my own business. And, and, and one by one, I had recruitment companies coming to me saying, they, you know, remembered the work I'd done at S3. And, and, and uh, so it just built from there. And, and so recruitment kind of became the niche. I was still doing corporate work. I was flying between New York with like companies like Pfizer and Ericsson in the Middle East and doing all the kind of big corporate uh, cultural change work. Um, based on my experience of working with um, the, the British inline hockey team, which is a, kind of another story in itself. But uh, I was getting invited in to talk about how to create locker room spirit in, in organi and, and organizational change. And, uh, but then but one by one, more recruitment companies. And I, I just found that, I, one, I enjoyed working with SMEs and because you could really roll your sleeves up uh, and, and also just having a lot of fun working <laughs> in the recruitment industry. <laughs> Yeah. Totally. I, I I remember S um S3 quite quite well. I mean they, they really made a ma name for themselves when they came onto the market. Um I'm I'm not sure a lot of people liked what they did sometimes, but um they they, they, white, you know. they, they, they definitely uh, changed, you know, they, they were one of the sort of transformation sort of players in the market at that play, mm -hmm. time as well. And um, you know, brilliant experience to see that company grow because it accelerated so quickly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah which is yeah. good. So in, in terms of, um, I mean, I've, I've done, you know, been reading a lot of your stuff, etc. as well. And um, it's really, you, you are a great believer of, you know, performing, growing businesses, helping other leaders to, to get to that level, but really getting everything in balance and not, you know, not, not really um, burning out. Is that what we're trying to do? Because we, in the recruitment industry, we have all been brought up with a work hard, play hard. I mean, I do it myself. Mm -hmm. Um and we're always going at 100 miles per hour. So, you know, I'm really interested in terms of your take on it, in terms of making sure that how do we get this balance in play? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I mean, in the book, I I, can't, I debunk work-life balance as a, as a concept that we can, you know, finish at five o'clock every day and, you know, so we can do the things we want to do. And, and so balance is, and particularly now in a, in, a, in a digital world, it can work for us and against us. So we can be on all the time or we can find a way to switch off and, and, and make it work for us. So, so obviously it, it's close to my heart for, for, for two personal reasons. One is, you know, that I come from a family of uh, business owners and, and, I, and I talk about this quite openly in my book, but, but my dad died at 48, um, brought on by sort of stress and anxiety of, uh, of losing the business and, and 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 making some bad decisions, you know, going all in and, and perhaps not thinking ahead. Um, and then, ironically, despite my beliefs around that, I, I found myself following a similar sort of pattern with my own business, consultancy business, traveling a lot, working with uh, the British team, probably putting more effort into the uh, the locker room than I was the my own family. And, and you get caught lost in that. So some hard learned lessons myself. Uh, so so it's become something that that I am passionate about because even my time at Yellow Pages, I was, you know, working with businesses over quite a long period of time, you know, going back, talking about their advertising, their, their, their marketing strategy. And you could see even those going on a trajectory, you know, from startup to burnout, essentially. 
Um, so it, it was always on my mind. Yeah. But obviously, it's not until you actually experience it and feel it yourself and, re and realize how easy it is uh, that you think, actually, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a way to do this. And, and that's where I sort of stumbled across the four keys, how it sort of manifested. And I'd always talked about mindset. I'd always talked about health and making the parallels between sports and business and being that executive athlete. Uh, but I never really talked about relationships. And I, and I think perhaps those that are starting businesses at that, that age where they've got children and families and, uh, and realizing that's just another dimension, you know, that, that we have to think about. And, and if that doesn't, uh, if that's not in, in place or we're not looking after our relationships and our health and our mindset, ultimately the business pays the price. But we often think we've got to get the business ahead you know, nail that three-year plan and everything else will be... Will, will Take care of itself. And, it, and actually, it's the other way around. And my, the people I've worked with that have experienced the four keys, they, they unanimously will say, since they focus on their body, relationships and mindset, that the business takes care of itself. It's just counterintuitive. So I want to dive into those four four keys there. And the, 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 just before though, and we were absolutely fine in terms of communication and and sound when we were in the mm. green room. But it does sound as though there's a bit of an echo with you just now yeah. as well. Yes, so yes, I just yes. wondered if you've got the sound coming out on a, on your PC as well. <laughs> yes, everyone's saying perfect. That's brilliant. Okay, let's try that. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. So let's kick back in there, um, and let's go into the 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 four. Four, um, four keys that you have mm. defined as your your sort of model that you help people with. Yeah, so the the, the the four keys are business, body, relationships, and mindset, and and it's a it's about how do we win daily in each of those. So I've got a bit of feedback, so I can hear myself speaking, but oh, no. but uh, yeah, so it's it's how do we win daily in each of those. So what, one of the things we talk about are having a three year plan. But often as business owners, we, we focus on the business plan, on the business vision. So we say, right, so what I want to achieve in the future. We don't really think about our, our health, our relationships and our mindset. So it's just about thinking about the vision and the why, the purpose across those four keys. And then looking at, OK, what can I achieve in 90 days that will get me to that vision faster? And then we break it down into daily targets. So we set these uh, challenges uh, four keys challenges where we, we hit each key every day uh, and that's the, that, that that's very powerful to kind of stay on top of it and be proactive and and not let these things sort of catch up with us or become and, urgent and so then when you when you're working with the leaders that that um in recruitment businesses i mean are those targets that are just business orientated or do they take targets in life you know what what can you give us some examples yeah it, it was a real mix so it's certainly when we um started the pilot back two years ago uh, so people who have clear business targets, uh, so the vision could be a numerical vision to achieve X amount of turnover. But then we'd say, so, but why? You know, who else benefits from that? So one of the things you make a distinction is between uh, the vision serving me as a business owner and the purpose serving others. So so, how, so who benefits from that vision? So if my my goal is to have a 10 million pound business what what what's the what's the motivation mm -hmm. to get you there uh and and then we would look at that vision in the, in the, in your health so how do you want to look how do you want to act how do you want to feel in in your body and and this isn't about uh setting targets to have a six pack or you know it it's it, it's kind of how do I want to feel you know, do I want to feel like I'm uh, I'm full of inflammation and sore and aching? And and then we start looking at, you know, how nutrition plays a role in that. Uh, Overtraining sometimes, you know, a lot of the business owners I work with, uh, that part of their profile isn't the fact they don't want to train. It's they train too much because they're all or nothing. Yes. Uh, so it's kind of the mentality. So it's kind of, bring, you know, just bringing that back a little bit. And then in relationships, how do I want to be showing up in my relationship? How do I want a relationship to be with my partner? And how do I want to feel mentally? So we get some, so it's a vision across those rather than just think about it from the business perspective. And, and what that does is it gets people to, it stimulates dopamine in the brain, gets them excited and energized, but it's a bit woolly at this stage. So we, we have to kind of start thinking from a more pragmatic perspective, which is what are my night-to-day outcomes? Okay. So what do I want to achieve in my business? What do I want to achieve my body? 
uh, my relationships and then my mindset and we get more met- metric focused. And when a sort of a person comes to you, at what stage of the business do you generally find that somebody is sort of engaging with you and looking for help? It doesn't it seem to matter whether there's a startup or a, a seasoned business owner okay. you know, with a, a well-established business. So it doesn't seem to discriminate in any way. Um, but what I am finding is that people come to see me too late. Right. And when I think about it from a business perspective, it kind of makes sense because, as I said to you earlier, we don't go to the doctor in case we get sick. Uh, I'm not suggesting I'm a doctor anyway, but as a business psychologist, we are looking at the health of the business. And um, so, so I'm trying to encourage people to think, think a bit more proactively and start to do some of these things daily, be, be aware of them so we don't so we avoid the burnout or avoid um, challenging relationships or, or you know, mental fatigue, whatever. So. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of like looking at the people that are actually going through, you know, some of these changes and making changes within their 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 business, is there a common sort of trend of the people that are able to adopt this better? Um, or you know, what what really when you're looking at recruitment owners and leaders, what differentiates between the sort of norm and the ones that really start to perform? I, I would say that those that are having more success either with this program or generally. Mm-hmm. tend to be more process driven okay so they, or they've learned to have a process you know so recruitment so that's is, interesting you can learn to yeah. have a process <laughs> yeah it's, it's just implementing some systems so things that seem uh kind of atypical to a recruiter or who, who perhaps are more cavalier more maverick entrepreneurial di- on the what, what we'd call a dynamic axis uh f- perhaps aren't as process driven Mm-hmm. So one of the things we talk about in business is that a lot of entrepreneurs have a natural ability to emotionally engage with their clients, their candidates, with their team, uh, to, to kind of be visionary, to think of where they want to take the business. But having a process and systems in place uh, doesn't always sit comfortably. So it's the ability to do performance, which is the numbers and the process and engagement and the emotional connection and be able to do both equally as well so I suppose if you were telling me that or you were in, in, um, um, sort of insinuating that's what I should be doing or um, giving me that idea how would I split my time what sort of percentage you know that's the sort of thing I would be thinking mm. yeah so uh, it's less about percentages so I, in my, on the back of the book it says devote equal time to bring balance to, to, uh, to your life if I was to rewrite that I would say equal attention yeah yeah because I, it's a bit, bit yeah, it's a bit misleading, I think. So I don't think we can devote equal time, mm-hmm. but it's the attention we're bringing, just that being mindful uh, that I am in a relationship and uh, that to remind ourselves that we're not just going all in on our business and, and thinking, well, you know, I, I'm working hard, so everyone's going to be thankful for that. Yeah. Um, and the truth is uh, the people that care about us want our time and want our attention uh, and not to be second best mm-hmm. or feel feel that way so so and it's the same with the health the body the body needs attention you know so you know it, it doesn't have to be hours in the gym um so i the, the worst thing that i i can hear when someone says to me i'm i'm gonna get healthy i'm gonna get fit you know i'm gonna turn, turn my life around and i say okay so what are your goals and so in 90 days i want to do my first ironman triathlon <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yep how about, how about three minute a three minute hit session a day? Yeah. You know, or how about a walk? How about a you know work towards a five k or something? But it's just that mentality that it's, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to smash it out of the park, um, and then and then you you spending more time running and training and you know eating and you know so, but that, but that's uh, that, that's not unusual. And, and it, I mean, I'm laughing, but I'm laughing almost at myself with that as well, because I can picture all my recruitment leader friends and recruiters that I knew were high performers and myself would do exactly that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it is a hard shift. So you see, you talk yeah. about a 90 day plan, but how do you get that to be actually changing your life throughout beyond that 90 day plan? So that's a good question. So when we first started doing these, we were getting such a such good results in the first 90 days that we thought if we do four of these a year it's going to be amazing but it's just not 
not possible because that, that does lead to burnout. So, so one of the th things we found was that if we did one a year or two a year, so like an H1 and an H2, yeah. there was a kind of compound effect. So it's, it's, it's about getting out of our comfort zone and stretching ourselves for a period of time. And then when we go back to our comfort zone, we're bigger, stronger, faster, leaner, more profitable, uh, pipelines being built up, you know, for that intense period of time. So if someone did one in January, there's a compound effect that pays dividends for the rest of the year from, you know, March onwards, okay. you know, April onwards. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's just knowing that if I, I can have some aggressive action for a period of time, I, it'll pay, it'll pay in the long run. So when we, when we talk about the, the 90 day, 90 day game plan, a lot of it's about timing as well. Am I, have I got the right time? You know, if you're going to have a baby in four weeks or you're getting married or you're, you're going to be on a sabbatical for four weeks or, you know, some of these things aren't going to play out as well. So, so if you think I've got 90 days where I can go all in, uh, that could be hugely beneficial. And then that makes sense. Working. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, to be honest, that sort of then sort of, you know, levels with me in terms of that is like all in and then sort of taking a wee step back, but it's making sure that you, you don't, you come back again, isn't it? Um, and I suppose yeah. that would lead me to the next question is that, you know, you know, I'm hearing I'm hearing great things. I, I, you know, I'm thinking if I'm going to build that 10 million pound business, I've got to and everyone out there will be thinking the same. It is like we've just got to work hard. We've got to work through and, you know, batter through these walls. Um, and now you're sort of going, no, there's an alternative way to do this. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sort of conflicted. Um how you know the mindset of a lifestyle business and a mindset of a growth business surely still is different i think i think they're different but the principles principles that i'm talking about remain whether it's lifestyle or not um you know lifestyle arguably is is supposed to give us more freedom more space more time uh but but if there's no pro if there's no process even that can catch up with us Mm -hmm. If we haven't got some milestones, uh, you know, to just to do these things consistently day in, day out, um, it, it can it can catch up with us, whether it's a, with a growth business or a, or a lifestyle. A lifestyle business. OK, and I've got a question here from Chris. Um, so, hey, Andrew, you know, when did you start your firm? So how long have you been doing this for now? 2012. Thanks for the question, Chris. Yes. Um, let us know if you've got any other questions and we'll get them in as well. Um so I suppose um, taking, I'm quite interested in the sports side as well. And a lot of the um, business owners are generally quite sports orientated too. What's mm -hmm. the difference in the sort of persona type that you'd be working for an elite sports person, you know, via a sort of recruitment business leader? So as far as profiling, mm -hmm. I think recruitment and sports are about as similar as it gets when it comes to parallels. Mm -hmm. I really do mindset and even physical health. You know, you've got to be on it, got to be sharp to be, to sustain to be sustainable at it. There, but there are some fundamental differences between sports and business, um, and 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 one of them in particular, which is where the, I think burnout stems from, is if you take a professional sports team, whether it's the coach or the players, they have so much downtime to think and reflect. And don't get me wrong; they're, they're pushing their bodies hard, you know, to the limit. But for the most part, they've got, they've got to focus for quite a short period of time. They're in the game once or twice a week and they're training 90% of the time. In business, it, it, it's the complete opposite. Mm. You're in the game every day. You know, so when a rec recruitment business owner is thinking, right, I'm in the game every day and I'm also in a, in a, you know, I'm married with, with, with a family and, oh, by the way, I want to two hours in the gym and I want to, you know, so they want to live like a professional athlete. They want to do similar sort of training, uh, but it's it's just impossible mm. in reality. Mm -hmm. so and we we're have just to that, remind ourselves of that. Yeah. And, and where's just that? Because I'm thinking, okay, is that time for holiday to go away and reflect? You know, is that one thing that you bring in as more time off? I think more downtime. Okay. So one thing I think I talked about in my first book was when people would come to me and say, "I'm having a problem with time management." and burnout and so on. And I would say, well, here's what you can do for 12 weeks. You're going to take an hour every week and do nothing. And the response would always be, I don't even have an hour to have lunch. Mm -hmm. Well, there's your problem, right? So 
just be disciplined to go for a walk in the park for that one hour and that the whole idea of slowing down to speed up you know we've all done it we've all had that moment where we've kind of sat on the bench for a while and all of a sudden we've got clarity and a few ideas we go back to the office and we action on it and we and we're far more productive uh, but so the whole idea of eating lunch at the desk and thinking we're being productive it's doesn't really ring true mm-hmm. so so it's not it's not so much about that one holiday a year that where we kind of shut down because we never truly do uh, or by the time we do it's time to fly back again uh, that, that actually it should be more consistent whether it's five ten minutes a day an hour a week you know um, that's it's key We've got a great question that's just come in there for Craig Dunn. Um, how do you switch off at bedtime and actually go to sleep? <laughs> Very good question. Yes. Uh, so one of the things I'm a big fan of is box breathing. And I put a video on YouTube about that or, or Google Mark Divine. Uh, he's an ex-SAS, uh, sorry, a Navy SEAL. So box breathing is, is kind of a, a way of engaging the, the parasympathetic nervous system so i'll rest and digest but typically if you're a business owner or an athlete thinking about the game the next day or all the things you've got to action as a business owner uh that the brain doesn't differentiate from one threat or another or being in the game or not in the game so it engages the sympathetic nervous system we get to get a fight flight it's very hard to sleep so just learning to you know whether it's meditation um it's space app or calm uh one a guy i found recently is a guy called rod striker he's got an app called um sanctuary it's got loads of good stuff on there mm-hmm. and after a while you start to find that you can get by without the um the apps yeah but, excellent yeah. And, and one for me so once you have gone through and worked with this leader i think one a good leader a successful leader is going to then thinking about how can they coach their team how can they help you know, instigate that culture in the company as well. Um, is that an area that you touch on or, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so my, my background is leadership and, and team coaching. Mm-hmm. It's the last two years I've been looking at how to help business owners manage their, you know, the work-life balance and health. But, uh, but developing a team and growing a team is, is really different between winning and losing when it comes to scaling your business. You know, how you win the hearts and minds, how you get galvanized towards a vision and a purpose and and even that is a process so i'm often asked to come and work with teams help them with their team dynamics their locker room spirit set the vision they think i've got some sort of magic dust that i'm going to sprinkle over them and they're going to become this effective high performing team yeah but you've got to go through something to become something you know and, and people forget that and they think because they're experiencing a tough time that and things have maybe got toxic that's where the lessons are. And that's where we're becoming a better team. It's just hard to recognize that at the time. So great leaders are brilliant at getting very clear about the vision, Mm -hmm. setting the vision and and knowing where we're going and and making it very compelling. But they're also brilliant at facilitating a team towards that that vision. So engaging them in how to get there, uh, you know, creating a roadmap together, identifying the problems that will get in the way, problem solving, critical thinking as a team. And ultimately, the best coaches are facilitators. They don't have to be the person with all the answers. And I learned that the hard way as as head coach for Team GB and sales teams that I've managed. You think you have to all do the answers. Mm -hmm. So so once once we've got the vision and we're engaging people, uh, I always say to business owners, make sure you've got a captain, you know, assistant captain, and be aware of the skeptics because they can be your best allies. So you, you're looking around your dressing room, but you need people who can sustain that culture when you're not there. Mm-hmm. You know, when you leave the dressing room, who's holding each other accountable? So you need that, that core leadership team. You need to test stuff out. You know, you need to be brave and, and allow people to, to fail and, and learn. But the most important thing when it comes to autonomy and getting people involved is to be absolutely ruthless on accountability mm-hmm. and holding people accountable. And that's often where we, where I see business owners uh, fall short. So uh, 
I'll tell you a challenge with that. If you're constantly facilitating and encouraging and coaching, where do you make that switch? Because I see a lot of owners um, struggle with that as well. Where do that switch to then make them accountable for it? How, how, how would you coach on that? So what, the, the business owner coaching the person or? Yeah, so basically, you know, so as a leader, you're yeah. encouraging everyone to come up with their own ideas. You're encouraging the culture of, um, you know, allowing them to make mistakes. You know, that's how I'm sort of reading that as well. But at some time you do have to switch that and make them accountable. And it's that switch that I see in the trigger that a lot of people st- struggle with as well. Well, it is because it can be a clunky conversation, particularly if someone hasn't met the expectations that they said they would do. So one of the things that's important for a leader is to is to contract with the with the individuals on their team. So if they're engaging them in the, the, the tactics and there's an expectation that someone's going to deliver on those, or they set an objective and they said they're going to co- commit to that, we, we have to understand what, why they fell short. Was it a skill issue? Or was it behavioural? Mm-hmm. If it's behavioural, it's a very different conversation because it could come down to laziness, attitude. If it's a skill issue, we can develop it. And that's using a sports analogy. So if you if you heard me coaching at the World Championships, you'll never hear me have a go at players about the skill. But if they if they're being lazy or they're not what we call operating above the, the buffer line, so we agree what's above the line behavior, what's below line behavior. I'm holding them accountable on stuff that's below the line, mm-hmm. and I'm recognizing, giving recognition for things they're doing above the line. I like and, that. And we have to, yeah. Well, we have to agree what type of conversation are we, you and I going to have if, we, if, if in, in three weeks' time, 90 days' time, or at the end of the year, we've not met that expectation? Mm-hmm. What do you want to hear from me? What role do I play as your coach? Mm-hmm. You know, um, we, we have to get very clear about what that is. So if we don't set it up that way, it's very hard to hold them accountable. So I always use Sir Alex Ferguson's example. <laughs> you know, I think we could write a whole... Well, there are books on him, but um, he, he's often re- referred to as this didactic, angry, red-faced man who's barking at everybody. But actually, when you hear him talk about his work at the work at Manchester United and his talks at Harvard, he, he's very much a facilitator, but absolutely ruthless on accountability. So if he didn't make, met the, meet the expectation, he was very hard on them, even to the point where he went into the nightclub and pulled all those players out because they'd agreed that he wouldn't be seen in the nightclub. You know, that was the agreement. That's below the line. You know, he had the permission. Yes. yes. So what, what can you do as a leader to have permission, mm-hmm. to give yourself permission? I think just the way that you phrased certain things on that, you know, it's, it's really cool and, and, and um, very easy to take that in and sort of put that into your business, which is great. Um, another on the flip side, I really like what Craig had said there as well. It's like, okay, that's all good, but what happens if you've got a really poor leader? <laughs> so how you know how would you be able to? What advice would you give to the people that are in good environments but have a poor poor leader leading them? There's the different variables around that, so we'd have to understand the context. As this Craig yeah. is <laughs> <laughs> trying to get a message across to someone else here. <laughs> Um, not sure but, <laughs> <laughs> but i suppose on the general concept of managing up yeah well certainly managing up it comes back to that contracting and uh, you know and feeding back to, to the leader you know a leader's measured on results so and and good or poor leadership could be subjective so if the environment's good and the team's getting results I find it hard to make a correlation between a poor leader. If you've got a good environment and seems to get results, but a new leader's come in who traps the cultural odds with the team, uh, they're going to get found out. Yeah. And I, I'm very much encouraging, I'm sure you'll share this view as well, is that, you know, it is your own destiny that you're in control of. And, you know, just as you've just said, you know, what is acceptable above the line and below the line? Well, there's Mm -hmm. nothing to stop, you know, somebody to actually say, listen, you know, I'm you're managing me. And this is how I would like to get managed. And you're going to get the best out of me. But I would like to agree what is going to make me work and what is not going to make me work with just a slight change of jargon, which is essentially the same that you're saying and you're saying to that leader and getting that sort of contract. Um, I won't 
uh, I mean, I would have been very difficult to manage in my earlier recruitment days. But, you know, I had a, a you know, a certain sort of uh, arrogance about me at that point um, in my younger youth that nobody would be able to manage me. And uh, right. I, I had to apply that sort of tactics to be able to feel comfortable even with somebody managing me that mm -hmm. that would allow me to not stop me from performing. But I think it's all about sort of really, as you said, putting the ownership in, um, you know, where you want to find the balance and everything you're working for and how you can achieve. And that's one of the benefits of recruitment, isn't there? There's no blockages there. It's all about no. what you can go and uh, deliver. Which Absolutely. Is it, you know, it's, it, it, it creates the opportunity to be entrepreneurial within the organization and take responsibility, be accountability for yourself. I think that's, uh, that's key. And, and, but I also think leaders, you know, particularly in recruitment, it can be faced with lots of people who, particularly top performers, mm -hmm who may be perceived as a little bit more selfish, a bit more, you know, eyes on the goal, <laughs> you know, uh, need, need development and coaching and feedback and, and, and shown how to, you know, to, to look sideways and not just straight on. Uh, and, and that's, and we, and we see that in, in sports, you know, you see it's, it's wonderful. I, I coached the British team for four or five years. So you saw these 22 year olds, you know, become 26, 27 year olds, and and it's great to see that to see them shift from this. It's, it's, well, essentially surviving. You know, let's not forget that people that are being inherently selfish are often that, that that's manifesting itself because they're in survival mode. Yeah, it might be a bit of fight flight. They're either working towards failing or working towards some. You know, they're, they're trying to avoid failure so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. That they're in a fight flight, mm -hmm. and so as a, as a leader, we have to have that emotional intelligence to recognise that, and to support them, to mentor them, to coach them, to challenge them. Um, but that's leadership. Yeah, and ultimately, then the the, the company, the team, etc., is going to benefit as a as a joint and uh, getting that right, which is um, the end goal and more more profit on the profit line. Um, I'm going to take it a little bit back into the actual recruitment industry because you're talking to lots of recruitment owners as well. Um, and so you're getting an insight as to what's happening on the market and where recruitment in generally is going. So just in the last sort of um, you know few minutes that we've got, you know, mm -hmm. where, where do you think our industry is going just now? What do you see as common trends um, in terms of, um, you know, because we've been in a state of flux in terms of, tran you know, transforming against, um, you know, in-house taking on more um, roles um, for for um, for their own recruitment or their responsibility, yeah. and you know the companies um, lots of spin-outs in the last few years as well. You know more competitive um, sort of playing field if it could get more competitive. So what mm -hmm. are you experiencing and hearing? Right, certainly internal uh, talent management is, is getting better and more sophisticated and starting to use more of the tools that that um, recruiters have, have been using. So we're seeing more recruiters take on roles versus, uh, you know, an HR person being put in that role. So, that, so that's, that's a challenge. So we've got to think about, as, as recruitment agencies, how do we compete with that? How do we differentiate? I also think we're seeing more business owners think about how they become a personal brand. So that solopreneur kind of type of business and, and scaling either with building teams of resources and being a thought leader in their sector. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I think anybody that can, can, can become a thought leader in their vertical has a, a significant competitive advantage in the industry to, to some of the bigger organizations that are, that are out there that, that, you know, being able to present yourself online uh, to, to speak, to, to go to a, events and speak, you know, and really, develop that that speaking skill and that ability to talk through the camera is is going to be a huge competitive advantage in the next 12 months um, so but definitely personal branding and, and work-life balance again it, you know it comes down to how do i automate my business and people think it's all about technology it, it's not just about technology it, it's a big part of it and improving that process but a bit, one of the challenges business owners have is that they value money over time Mm -hmm. but the business owners that get it value their time over money so they're prepared to invest and outsource something that, that they look at it as a cost 
but not realizing that the time they're spending doing the work themselves could, could be, could, they could get a much bigger return on their investment being out, you know, in, in, do, doing an event than, than staying up all night working on admin or something like that. You know, just yeah. get this stuff out there. Yeah. There's plenty of people that are better than, the, you know, the actual business owner that can, can do it and they can play to their strengths. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think just having that <clears throat> that course or time blocked out as well. I mean, you were really good at that. This is why this crowdcast is on a Friday afternoon unusually, because, you know, ultimately you dedicate your Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to your online coaching. Um, That's right. And yeah. then, you know, you have certain days that you're out and about doing things like this, being on our guest, et cetera, as well, that, yeah. you know, you're, you know, you're doing your sort of promotion side of it as well which I think was you know hats off to you for doing that um because we we probably in a recruitment industry you know we'll just we're reacting to whoever wants to see us and we're not controlling the week as it should be perhaps as well yeah controlling your diary is by far the, the most important thing any business owner can do and it's your diary it's no one else's it's not your clients it's not your candidates it's not your teams it's yours so whatever goes in there is your choice I think everybody listening, if that's one thing they can take away, you know, start, uh, I'm going to go and wait and let everybody else not see my diary so they can't just book it all out <laughs> and make sure I'm now suddenly in control. Uh, but if everyone else takes that, then then that's that's a one change that they'll get from this session. Um, so just to finish up, if everybody or if anybody wants to connect with you, Andrew, or they want some more information or to get your book, you know, where is the best place to get this? Uh, so LinkedIn is my biggest playing ground. So anybody that I'm not connected to, be great to connect with you. Uh, the, the four keys, but latest book is, is is on Amazon. So if you just if you're interested, you, Amazon, just type in my name and it'll or the four keys. It'll bring and it up. Francis is saying, is it is it an audio? Not yet. Oh, not yet. I'm working on it, Francis. Good. <laughs> I'm a big audio person as well. Don't read. I'm so, definitely yeah, going that you'll way. have to do yeah. that for us, Francis. I'm with you. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, I'm, I'm sure my team will be able to sort of post out your your LinkedIn um, address and contact details and and link to book etc. As well. So, um, listen. Thank you so much. Yes, lots of people asking already. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed it. It's been yeah, and you know, I think there's been lots of takeaways there in terms of finding the triggers, making sure you're balancing time and shut off your diary, everyone as well, and control your diary. Yeah. So um yeah. Andrew, thank you so much. Um enjoy Pleasure. your weekend. Um I know I'm you gonna do. enjoy mine better now as well. All right. Thanks a <laughs> thank lot. You. Bye everybody. Bye -bye. Good luck.